Hello everyone, this is Eye on Africa for Wednesday, August 25th. Here are the headlines. More than 50 Afghan refugees arrive in Uganda at the request of the United States. 2,000 more are expected to be flown there in the coming days. South Africa's unemployment rate skyrockets to its highest level in 13 years. More than a third of South Africans are now without a job, the highest number worldwide. And we will take you to Djibouti to tell you the story of their national dish, a story that began hundreds of years ago in another continent. But first, 51 Afghan refugees in Uganda are in Uganda after flying there from Afghanistan. In a statement, the country's foreign ministry said the United States requested it host at-risk Afghans while they're being processed. 2,000 further arrivals are expected in the coming days. France 24's Bastien Renouy reports from Nairobi. The 51 refugees arrived in Antebe Airport this Wednesday morning aboard a privately chartered flight. Uh, they underwent security screenings before being tested for COVID-19. And then uh, they went to an hotel where they will quarantine for the next days. Uh, about three buses, we could see these men, women and children looking through the windows to discover uh, this country that will host them for the next few weeks. They will only stay in Uganda for a short period of time because according to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, from Uganda and they're here in transit. They will soon go to the United States or to other uh, countries worldwide. Uganda is the first country in Africa to host Afghan refugees, but it won't be the, uh, the only one. Uh, Rwanda already announced that they will uh, receive soon 250 uh, girls and their teacher from the only uh, boarding school uh, for girls in Afghanistan. They are currently in Qatar. They should fly soon to Kigali and they will uh, stay in Rwanda for at least a semester. Uh, the director of the school said that they will then go back to Afghanistan if the situation on the ground allows it. But it's impossible for now to say if the Taliban will allow uh, this school to reopen one day and if these girls and their teachers will be able to go back to that country safely. Now here's a quick look at some of today's top stories from across the continent. Three police officers and a security guard have been killed by a lone gunman in the Tanzanian capital. The shooting happened near the French embassy in Dar es Salaam, but at this stage authorities say it, they do not, it does not appear excuse me, the shooter was targeting the building. Police arriving on the scene shot the man dead. Six bystanders were injured. The Nigerian city of Jos has been placed under a 24-hour curfew after at least 16 people were killed in an attack on Tuesday night. Assailants raided properties, killing people and destroying their homes. Authorities have not given an official death count, but hospital officials say at least 16 bodies were brought to the morgue. The city of Jos is on the dividing line between the country's Muslim North and Christian South and has seen years of ethnic and religious violence. Morocco's foreign minister has called Algeria's decision to sever diplomatic ties with it, quote, completely unjustified. He added that the decision was made based on false, even absurd pretexts. Algeria made that decision on Tuesday following months of deterior deteriorating relations with its neighbor. In recent weeks, authorities there have accused Morocco of supporting a Berber independence group who itself has been accused of starting the deadly forest fires in Algeria earlier this month. Now to South Africa, where unemployment has soared in recent months. The jobless rate in the country has hit its highest level in 13 years, with coronavirus restrictions partly to blame for an economic downturn. Nadine Theron has more from Cape Town. Statistics South Africa on Tuesday released the country's latest unemployment figures and they show that South Africa now has the highest unemployment rate in the world as tracked by Bloomberg, although data from some countries is unavailable or unreliable. The figures show that women, especially black women, are the most vulnerable population group with an unemployment rate of 41% compared to the national average of 34%. Over 64% of young people between the ages of 15 and 24 are unemployed. Well, that figure drops to 43% for people between the ages of 25 and 35. Most of these young people are not in training or receiving an education. 
the record unemployment rate can't be blamed solely on the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic or the South African government's strict lockdown regulations. The effects of apartheid are still prevalent, as 38% of black people are unemployed, while only 8% of white people experience the same dilemma. Regular power outages have also contributed, as did the recent riots, which cost the South African government more than 3 billion euros. It's no wonder the South African GDP has shrunk by 6.4% over the last year and is expected to contract further still in the third quarter of this year. To help its citizens who lost their jobs in the pandemic, the South African government has just reinstated a monthly COVID-19 social relief of distress grant of 350 rand. That's around 20 euro. Chad's government has said there will be no national tribute to former dictator Hissen Habre. The 79-year-old died from coronavirus on Tuesday, five years after he was sentenced to jail for crimes against humanity. 40,000 people were killed under his brutal rule from 1982 to 1990. Nicolas Germain has more on the reactions following Habre's death. Hissen Habre was a controversial figure. On Wednesday, only a few Chadian newspapers put a picture of him on their front page. The former dictator ruled Chad between 1982 and 1990. In 2016, he was sentenced to life imprisonment for crimes against humanity. Some Chadians said Abre was a great patriot who consolidated the nation's administration. The Association of Victims of His Crimes strongly disagrees. One investigation estimated that more than 40,000 people were killed during his time in power. On Wednesday, one of Abre's wives said he would be buried in Senegal where he died. The Chadian government said there would be no national tribute for the former president because of his jail sentence and out of respect for his victims. Private contractors in Tanzania have signed a contract with a Dubai-based architect to build a 70-story building in Zanzibar. The project would cost some $1.3 billion, equivalent to more than 60% of the island's annual budget. Zanzibar's Minister of State in the President's office says the project is a big step toward building the island's blue economy. The building will house 560 apartments as well as luxury hotels, resorts and a golf course. It would be the second tallest building in Africa behind Egypt's iconic tower. Finally tonight, let's take you to Djibouti. The tiny coastal nation on the Horn of Africa is home to thousands of years of immigration and cultural exchange, and that history is still part of Djiboutians' daily life today. For example, the country's national dish is fish, Yemeni style. Take a look. You slice the fish in half, season with salt, then brush it with the sweet pepper imported from Ethiopia. Once marinated, put it in a traditional oven. 15 minutes of cooking and it's ready to eat. This is how to prepare fish Yemeni style. The dish is a national institution, except this is Djibouti. It reflects the Djiboutian identity. It's a recipe imported from Yemen that we have appropriated and which is part of our culinary tradition. Abubakar Musa is a former celebrity journalist on national television. Two or three times a month he visits this restaurant quite famous in Djibouti city. It has also become a family tradition. His granddaughter Sohan, who lives in Belgium, was not fond of fish until her grandfather converted her. He got me to try it and then told me it was Djiboutian fish. You have to taste it. If you don't eat it in this restaurant, you haven't come to Djibouti. You have no proof of coming to Djibouti. I tried it and I liked it a lot. And every time I come to Djibouti, he brings me here and I'm so happy. 
The recipe is passed down from father to son. In the restaurant Sheikh Hamdani, it's a family affair. Omar's grandfather migrated to Yemen and settled in Djibouti in the 1920s. He brought the recipe from Yemen and started the restaurant. Omar is now the third generation to run the eatery. Local neighbors and celebrities alike enjoy a meal here for a thousand Djiboutian francs, fewer than six dollars. It's not an expensive dish, it's a simple dish, accessible to everyone. From small to young to old, everyone has access to it. A few kilometers away, in the working class district of PK-12, this dish brings a feeling of home to Amin Maktal, who fled the war in his country, Yemen. As long as I am in this restaurant, eating here, surrounded by my compatriots, I feel good, because everything I had in Yemen, I have it here. It is a little surprise that Yemeni cooking made it across the Gulf of Aden to this tiny coastal nation nestled between Africa and Arabia. But it is perhaps ironic that this fish recipe is so big here. Back home, it is simply one among many others. That looks very good. Thank you for watching Eye in Africa. The news continues on French 24 in just a moment. If you want to really understand what's going on in the world, you need to follow the money. In People and Profit, we tackle the biggest stories in the global economy and break down why they matter to you. From mega mergers to market crashes and those new business ideas that just could change the world. In this economy, it's the show you can't afford to miss. Join us every week for your essential business briefing. People and Profit on France 24 and France24.com.